good morning. And welcome to the service today. We're going to stand and sing, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and please then remain standing for prayer. John, first chapter, the first verse, one through five, if you want to follow along. John chapter one, one through five. And God's word says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. We have a lot to pray for this morning, and there's a lot of people absent today, so let's, let's bow our heads and um, speak to God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this day that we can come and worship you um, in this season in which your son was sent to the world to uh, die for our sins. God, we thank you for um, your awesome power. Just like these verses said, you are the creator, you are the beginning, you are the end, God. And then sometimes it's our words just can't express your majesty and the praises that are due to your name, God. I pray this morning that we would clean our hearts, um, worship you truly, give you the praise that's due to your name, and we would go forth and carry the gospel out in our community and in our families. Um, we thank you for sending your son and uh, saving us for something we couldn't do. Thank you for the blood that was shed and um, the gift given to us. We pray, um, we want to lift up quite a few people. We have a lot to, uh, um, a lot of people that are in need of prayer. We think of Steve Williams um, seeking a job, Ross Schaup and his grandfather's funeral, that's this weekend. Ray Starr, who's in the uh, hospital with uh, going through some blood clotting and heart issues. Think of Jan Leedy and Gerald Glick and their health and the care that they need, God, and just lift them up in this season especially. 
We think of Sharon Freed's mother that uh, is also receiving hospice care. Um, Mike Kimbody, who has an upcoming um, transplant surgery in January. We lift him up and hope that is successful. We think of Paul Fox and his recovery, um, the healing that's going on and the pain that he's going through right now. So just please uh, touch his body. Um, we think of uh, um, just everyone else that can't be here. We think of our uh, cantata tonight, that uh, singing praises to your name, that it would uh, just uplift us. Thank you for the choir and the preparation they've put in and um, the children's program and things like that, God. So we just have a lot to praise your name for, and we thank you that uh, you seek us and we can have a personal relationship with you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. If you want to open your bulletin, I'm just, we just have a few announcements today. This evening's service is at 6 o'clock. Um, this is the Christmas program for all the toddlers and the kids, um, followed by the adult cantata. Afterwards, there is a fellowship, so bring, please bring a snack or dessert to share. Um, and also, if you have time after following this service, um, we could use help setting up tables and chairs in the back. So if you have a few minutes um, that you can lend a hand with that, that would make it go faster. Um, also, the cookies for cookies for first responders organized by Elena. If you could sign up by Christmas Eve, this 24th, and bring your cookies by the 27th, leave them at the church so she can pass those out. Next Sunday, it's just a regular service. There will still be Sunday school and worship um, service at the same time followed by a candlelight Christmas Eve service at 6 p.m., and that is next week. And that is all the announcements I have. Thank you. Good morning. At this time of the year, we like to recognize some um, special individuals who do uh, go above and beyond for this congregation. And we'd like to start off with Paul Dean and Holly. So Paul Dean, if you'll come up. And the board and the congregation would just like to thank both of them for the work they put in with our music ministry and all the extra effort that they do there. So we thank you for that. <laughs> Cameron, if you could come up. So Cameron and Angelica have been with us now almost a full year, and we just thank them for all that they do for us, and we would like to uh, express that with a gift. It has been a, a year for me of growth, of love, and so many ways, uh, my family's grown, my love for this congregation has grown. Um, I, I'm humbled beyond words to know so many of you have been so generous to us and kind and simply say thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful year and look forward to all the Lord has for us, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Pastor and Beth, if you wanna come forward. Another year has gone by, another great year, and we again just wanted to thank you for all the excellent service that you give us as a congregation. We are very honored to be able to serve here, and we're so thankful for a wonderful year that God uh, has uh, been doing some wonderful things in the heart and ministry of the church. The number of families who have come and joined the church, number of baby dedications, number of baptisms, and we just look toward the future in anticipation of God doing even greater things than this. So from the bottom of our hearts, my wife and I would like to say thank you for your special gift to us this morning. Merry Christmas. If you would please stand as we sing our praise and worship songs together. Come sing. 
The starlight was shining, the wise men were led. Come see the baby and worship him. His name is Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father.
precious promise, Son of God and Son of Man. Heaven's glory in a manger has come to us in Bethlehem. Worship Christ. 
right, thank you for that beautiful music. Let's turn to the book of John, if you have your Bibles. And John's gospel is so unlike the book of Luke when it comes to the Christmas story. John chapter 1. If you like the nativity scene, it's in the book of um, Luke. John's gospel gives us what's going on behind the manger scene from a heavenly perspective. I'm trying to find John. <laughs> have to have my wife find it for me, I guess. But uh, did I say they're unique? Yes, Luke's gospel is so unlike um, John and Luke's Gospels are different when it comes to the Christmas story because John is fixated on the little baby that's in a manger. Sometimes when I was growing up, you saw uh, manger scenes and the focus would be on the shepherds and Joseph and Mary and sometimes in the manger itself would be a little plastic baby, kind of as a turnoff when you see that sort of a thing. But I want you to understand, John's gospel is unlike the other three gospels. He's just fixated on Christ. And his intent, he tells us at the end of the book, his, his purpose, his goal in writing the book, is so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that, you could have life through his name. So he's focused on Christ. John wrote five books, and uh, he wants you to understand five different things about Christ. Number one, Christ was virgin born. And he was virgin born so that you could be born again. The bloodline of Adam was contaminated with sin. And so of necessity, Jesus couldn't be born through a human being. But God, in his miraculous way, allowed Mary to be uh, conceived by child by means of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus was sinless in his birth, sinless in his life, and sinless in his death. And that's exactly what God the Father demanded of a sacrifice in order for you and I to receive salvation. So there was a virgin birth. But the second thing John wants you to know is that Jesus has a virtuous life. Not just a virgin birth, but a virtuous life. Absolutely sinless. Remember we talked about the lamb last week and how they took that lamb before it was slaughtered when they were coming out of Egypt and they were to keep that lamb for four days and they were to investigate it closely and make sure it had no blemishes. Jesus had three and a half years of ministry here on earth. And during those three and a half years, they were investigating carefully the life of Jesus Christ, trying to find something in what he said, trying to find some inconsistencies in his life. But Jesus not only had a virgin birth, he had a virtuous life. Aren't you glad for that? But then Jesus died what we call a vicarious death. And don't let that word scare you. It simply means a substitute. Jesus actually died in your place. Because whether you know it or not, you and I deserved to die on the cross. It was our sin that put Jesus there. But he went there on your behalf. And even that's not the end of the story. A virgin birth, a virtuous life, and a vicarious death. But there was a victorious resurrection. Aren't you glad? I mean, you can't keep truth down forever. And you can't keep truth locked up in a tomb forever. Eventually, it'll come to the surface. And on the third morning, we're thankful to be able to report that Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Now, those four things have already happened. What do you suppose the chances are the final thing happening? His virgin birth, his virtuous life, his vicarious death, his victorious resurrection. You want to know something? He's coming back visibly again one day. The visible return of Jesus Christ. And I just read the, um, the Prophecy Today newsletter, which we get here at our church, and Mike Wingfield's given us permission to reproduce it. So I noticed there's several copies out in the lobby this morning if you've not picked yours up. 
But Mike did a wonderful job going through with what happened on October the 7th over in Israel and comparing it with what the Antichrist is going to do in the, the book of Revelation. You might want to pick up a copy and just realize how at any moment, folks, Jesus Christ could come back for the church, which will then usher in the seven years of awful tribulation here on planet Earth. If you're not ready to go to heaven, I would listen carefully to John's gospel this morning as we uh, go forward here. So John is fixated on the person of Christ. He wants to show you that Jesus Christ, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is indeed God, very God. And he performed a lot of miracles. And uh, again, at the close of the book, uh, John wrote and he said, now this is the purpose I wrote the book, a little key to let you in the book, understand the book. Many other miracles or signs did Jesus in the presence of his followers, which are not written in this book, but I, I've given you a few of these things in about seven different miracles in John's Gospels, not recorded in the other Gospels, that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, why do I have this up here this morning? Well, I happen to like Norman Rockwell. He graced the covers, what, 323 times of the Saturday Evening Post, one of the oldest newspapers, which was actually printed uh, where Benjamin Franklin did a lot of his work in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And for about 50 years, he graced the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. But um, one of the things about Norman Rockwell is that he had 4,000 paintings, and he said, I don't have enough time to paint everything I want to paint. And remember, that's what jo John said as he closed the Gospel of John. Many other things Jesus did in the present, but, but I, I, the scrolls couldn't contain them all. But I've given you these so that you might believe Jesus is who he said he is, and he's going to do what he said he would do. Now, the reason I like this particular picture is because it's a Thanksgiving meal, and most Americans can relate to this. But this image especially reminds me of the Gospel of John. Because John's Gospel is so unique. You see the guy down here in the right-hand corner? He's looking out at you. Almost as if he's inviting you. Would you like to come down and sit with us here and enjoy this meal with us? And that's kind of the way John writes his little gospel. Dear reader, he'll pause it once in a while. Dear reader, don't you understand? I'm, I'm talking to you. And I'm telling you that if you'll repent of your sin, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you can come in and you can sit down at this banquet meal with the rest of us. It's very personal. I love the way John does it. I hope to point some of this out as I go along this, this morning. But at the end of the book, he says... A lot of other things Jesus did, but, but I want you to know I, I've collected seven different miracles, not in the other Gospels, but I've included them in my Gospels so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And if you believe that, guess what? You can come in and sit down and enjoy this meal with the rest of us. By the way, do you believe that this morning? That Jesus Christ, that little baby, which is not in a manger here in John's Gospel, in John's gospel, he was dispatched from heaven. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we could see him with our eyes. We could hear him with our ears. We could touch. We could handle him. All the evidence that would stand up in a court of law today, Jesus manifested when he was here on earth. In other words, it's a very historical, a very real truth. I, out of uh, curiosity this week, I googled, who is the greatest person who ever lived, according to Google, right? What do you think I found? Well, I found a variety of things. In fact, some did actually start with Jesus, which I was surprised by that. But the Wall Street Journal got my attention. They had uh, Hammurabi as number one of the greatest person who ever lived. And they had Julius Caesar. And they had uh, some others like that. And finally, Jesus Christ took 13th place, according to the Wall Street Journal, as the greatest person who ever lived. Well, can I just remind you this morning, the greatest person who ever lived is John's gospel. It's Jesus Christ. He's fixated on that. Look down at verse 14. He mentions the word word three times in verse 1, and he says in verse 14 that this word, the word was made flesh. Four words in the Greek. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we, the word beheld here is the word, we get the word theater. You ever been to a theater where you could actually see it? Jesus came. He didn't just levitate and stay here for a few minutes or a few days or a few weeks. 
He dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory that was as the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. And so up in verse 12, which is what we're going to eventually end up at this morning, the Bible says, but as many as received him. All right? That guy in Norman Rockwell's painting who turns around and looks at you, he's saying, hey, what are you going to do about all this? Would you like to join us? Would you like for this to be a part of your life? And here's how it happens. As many as, in the Greek that word means to reach out and take hold with the hand. As many as receive him. To those individuals, he gives the authority, the right, the power to become the children of God, even to those that believe on his name. So what are you going to do about it? And John just keeps asking that question over and over throughout his gospel. What are you going to do about it? So what's the heart of Christmas? How can I experience the real power of Christmas? And is it possible to have Christmas without the shepherds? Without the wise men, without the manger scene, if you had it, this is how it would be. John's gospel presents Christmas without all the nostalgia. Look at what he says in verse 1. In the beginning, right out of the gate, John starts with who this wonderful Savior is, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in the beginning. And I want you to know that when he says in the beginning, it's not a starting point. In the beginning was ever before there was time. Before ever there was time is what John's referring to. He's going to stretch your mind here this morning. And he's going to say, if you can think of eternity past in that direction, before ever there was time, Jesus Christ already was in his being. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is not a reference to a starting point. This is a reference to a state of being. Jesus Christ is and always will be eternally God. He's God. Let me try to put this in human terms so we can relate to it. Eternity past, eternity future. And right in the middle of it, the Trinity... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit decided to place what we call time. Time is a device in which mere mortals like you and I use as a tool to relate to this period in which we live. But I want you to understand that before ever there was time, there was eternity. And in all of eternity past, there was Jesus Christ. He is God, very God. He's eternal. And God gives you and me a gift this morning. That gift is called time. And when I was down in uh, my home state of Florida a couple of months ago now, I went to a couple of different cemeteries just to see some individuals that I had known growing up. And I noticed that on the grave markers, there would be their birth date and there would be the day that they died. And right in the center, there was a little dash. And I thought as I saw some of those dashes, what are you going to do with your life? You were given a birth date. And if you live long enough and Jesus Christ doesn't return, there will be a death date. And the question I'm asking you this morning is, what are you doing with the gift called time, T-I-M-E? Jesus stepped down out of eternity past. He stepped into time. And John says, in the beginning. And I want you to notice three things here. And this is what God, John gives us to kind of hang our hats, to try to understand the, the depths of what John's talking about here. Some of the experts that I came across this week said that John writes on the level of a second grader. He only uses about 600 words as an entire gospel. And he's got quite a, an economy of words going here so that we can understand who God is. And notice what he says about him. In the beginning was the word. And that's the idea that ever before there was time, God existed. He's eternal. But notice he was with God. There's the Trinity right there. And notice that he stands by himself. He was God. And so if you were in the theology class, and I'm not intentionally trying to make this difficult, one of the things they would teach you is that this is the preexistent God. 
He existed ever before there was time. He's eternal. In the beginning was the Word. Before there was time, there was Jesus Christ. There was Jesus Christ ever before there was time. And he was with God. They weren't competing. There was no competition in the Godhead. As a matter of fact, Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, verse 5, as he's going to the cross, he says, Restore to me the glory which I had with you before the world was. I mean, they had communion with each other. In eternity past, before ever there was time, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you read in the original language, they were just face to face, enjoying fellowship and communion with one another. And so my God is preexistent before ever there was time. My God is coexistent with the Father, with the Son. And my Father is self-existent. He stands by himself. That is when Jesus came into this world, they saw him. They watched him perform these seven different miracles recorded in John's gospel, not in the other gospels. One of them is that Jesus uh, put clay on a man's eyes and asked him to go... Uh, dip in the pool of Siloam. And when they saw Jesus do that, and the man, his eyesight was restored, they were seeing God come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. He was pre-existent, co-existent. He was self-existent. One speaks of his, his eternality in the past. One speaks of his equality with the Father and the Spirit in the present. And the other speaks of his essence. He is pure, absolute being, deity. And that's what John wants us to see, that baby in the manger is God, very God, who he is. So recognize, John says, who he is. And recognize that our Savior is not like the God of the Mormons or the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, they believe that there was a God who made the God of the Bible who made Jesus Christ. Absolutely not. My Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, if we or an angel preach any other gospel under you other than that which you have received, let him be accursed. My God is the God of the Bible who is eternal. He always has been. He always will be. But notice what he does now in verses 3 through 5. The Bible says that all things were made by him. This is one of the things that separates our God from all the lesser gods in the world. Not only is my God and John's presentation of Jesus Christ, not only is he eternal, but he is the God that can do what no other God can do. He can create something out of nothing. And have you noticed now in John's gospel that sounds very familiar to the book of Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Notice verse 1 again, in the beginning was the Word. You see, that was the original creation in the book of Genesis. This is his new creation in your heart. He wants to do for you what he did in the beginning at Genesis. He wants to make you and remake you into the image of his son Jesus Christ. So all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Again, that's something that only God himself can do. The real, true, eternal God. No other God can create like this. But notice the word made is used three times. And my God, John says, is able to communicate. Aren't you glad God communicates with us? Would you read your Bibles again? Look at verse 1. The word word is used three times. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. My God wants to have a conversation with you. He's not up in heaven somewhere hiding. But if you have sensitive ears to hear it, he wants to communicate with his creation. And I know I resisted and I rebelled and I ran from that for 17 years until one day I heard God speaking to my heart. And one day I heard God knocking on my door. And one day I opened up the door and just like that Norman Rockwell painting, I came and I sat down and I began enjoying fellowship with the eternal creator of God. He wants to communicate with you. In him was life, not just bios, breath, existence, but notice this, the word zoe. It's absolute fullness or eternal life. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
And that's what God wants to do in your life. If you think about the creation account, what's the first thing God did on day one? He said, let there be light. And there was light. Wherever God goes, the light switch goes on. When he invaded my heart, the light switch went on and put new desires within me that I never had before. That's who he is, John says, and that's what he does best. He creates and he wants to communicate with his creation. And that light, John says, is shining in the darkness. And that darkness cannot overcome it. If you ever go down to Ruby Falls in Chattanooga, I never will forget the first time I went down there. You take an elevator shaft down and you walk for quite a ways in the dark. There are other little lights along the pathway, but finally when you get in the back, they turn all the lights off. And you hear this rushing water. And all of a sudden you can hear this energy starting to kick in, these floodlights kicking in. And the floodlights come on and they are just show the waterfall itself and you're just blown over by it. You were in complete darkness and your eyes adjusted to that and all of a sudden they hit the spotlights, the floodlights, and you're just overwhelmed with the light. John says, the light came into this world. Born at Bethlehem, laid in a manger. The light was shining in darkness. and The darkness was not able to overcome it, comprehend it. They didn't understand it. As a matter of fact, you know what they did to the light. They put them on a cross. So on day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's what he wants to do in your life this morning. If you read John's gospel carefully and you go through it, he'll say to you, John 3, 16, for example, you know what? God so loved you, world. He gave his only begotten son for you, ma'am, that if you will believe in him, you don't have to perish, but you can experience everlasting life. Because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But please understand this. When he comes in to take over residence of your heart, he's going to go to work immediately. I mean, on day one in the book of Genesis, he said, let there be light. Day two, he made the heavens. Day three, he made the earth. And day four, notice what happens now. He starts filling that which he created. And I've noticed in my Christian life, God didn't just want to make things in my life and recreate me. But he wants to fill my life with good things. Things that I never would have chosen would be good things, but God chooses them. And God says, I want you to study my word. I want you to have a relationship with me through prayer. I want you to have a family that you can go home to and experience a little taste of heaven here on earth. So he filled the sky with the sun, moon, and stars. He filled the seas and the dry lands with birds and animals, and that came in chapter, uh, verse, day six, rather, the animals and man. But he, he put uh, sea creatures on day five in, in the oceans. But what God did in the book of Genesis, he wants to do in your heart today. That's the point. One of the early church fathers says that Jesus Christ is not going to be valued at all until he's valued above all. And how did John start his gospel? Not with a manger scene. But he wants you to know this Christmas that the real heart of Christmas, when you dig down into the middle of it, is this baby in a manger who's God, very God, period. And he's God because he always existed in the past. He's God because he's the only God that can speak the word and bring something into existence that never existed before. And what he did physically, guess what? He can do spiritually for you and me this morning. So that's where John is heading with all of this. And right out of the gate, verses 1 through 3, he says, do you believe this? Do you recognize that Jesus is God? Paul said it this way in Colossians 2, verses 9 through 10. In him dwelleth. Notice he didn't just levitate a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, and then go back. No, he was here for 33 years. He had a public ministry, three and a half years. And we saw in him. The fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. He's all you need, which is the head of all rulers and the head of all authorities. So number one, John is asking us to recognize that Jesus is God. Have you recognized that yet? What's it going to take for you to hear God knocking on the door of your heart, inviting you to come in and sit down and have a banquet with him and his kingdom? Now I notice the next thing John did is he began to tell us we need to recognize 
that Jesus is God and then respond to the light that he's giving you. Because you're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised more light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, John said in his first epistle, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We ought to be walking in the light. And so in verse 4 he says, in him was life. And that life was the light of men. You know, Satan wants to keep you in the dark. God wants to bring you to his banqueting table and give you light. I was just thinking through the Gospel of John this week, and if you just turn a page in my Bible, notice how lengthy chapter 3 is. John chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a religious leader of all people. He should have known these things because he saw Jesus working miracles down in Jerusalem and saw him working signs and wonders. And so he approached him in verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees whose name means literally conqueror. And he said, Jesus, I've got a question to ask you. Verse 2, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God. No man can do these miracles that you're doing except God be with him. And would you notice the off-the-wall answer Jesus gives in response to that? Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. It's like, where would that come from? Jesus knew this man's heart. He knew that even though he was a religious leader, Satan had him successfully in his grasp. And John is going for the juggler here. Jesus is going for the juggler and says, Look, except you're born again, Nicodemus, you're not going to God's heaven. And then there's a lengthy dialogue. And then it says, John, as though John pauses in verse 16 and 17, he says, Look, th this is for you, world. This is not just for Nicodemus. There are a lot of people attending church this morning who are religious, but they're blind, and Satan has them in the, his grasp. Then you go to the next chapter, and here's a, the other end of the spectrum. If Nicodemus was a male, and he was a leader of the Jews, religious, well, here's a female, and she's a Samaritan woman. And if you'll notice how long this chapter is, the dialogue is incredible. And Jesus takes this woman, notice in verse 9, she sees him as a Jew. This is chapter 4, verse 9. Chapter 4, verse 11, she says, sir. 4, verse 15, she calls him sir again. In verse 19, she says, I perceive you're a prophet. Her eyes are starting to open. Down in verse 25, she sees, you see the word Messiah. The woman saith unto him, I know Messiah when he comes, which is called Christ. When he's come, he's going to tell us all things. And Jesus says unto her, I that speak unto you am he. And we know she got the real disease. Look at verse 20, 28 here. Well, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this bingo the Christ? And so in John's gospel, he's fixated on the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is. Why he's come. He wants you to recognize this is God. But respond to the light that he's giving you. Nicodemus, respond to the light. And by the way, you have to go all the way over to chapter 19 of the Gospel of John to see Nicodemus did respond to the light. That's where he came along with, who was it? Joseph of Arimathea. And together they wrapped the body of Jesus and laid him in a borrowed tomb. Jesus started with a borrowed womb and ended in a borrowed tomb. And he ascended and reigns on high forevermore now. Aren't you glad for that? So Satan wants to keep you in the dark, but Christ has come to give you the light. Are you receiving the light? Notice what he says. I'm back now in John chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. He gives us this insight of John the Baptist, a witness who rolled out the red carpet for John, for Jesus before he came. Verse 6 says, there was a man who was sent from God. His name was John. If your name is John this morning, your name literally means Jehovah's gracious. Isn't God gracious to send someone like John the Baptist to roll out the red carpet to announce the way of the Lord? The Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the King of all kings, he's here. And notice what it says. It says, there was a man sent from, John who's, uh, from God whose name was John, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. 
So here's the messenger. He comes to give the message that Jesus is the light of the world. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That's his motive. is to roll out the red carpet for the Lord Jesus Christ and to declare, as John the Baptist did, behold, two times in chapter 2, behold the Lamb of God. I'm not the Savior of the world. There's the Lamb of God, and he takes away the sin of the world. And you know something? By his Holy Spirit, the God, the Father, sent his son Jesus who died on that cross. He was crucified, but he rose the third day. He promised his followers, now before I leave, I want to tell you something. As I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's to your advantage that I go away so he can come. And do you know that's exactly what happened? The Holy Spirit is in a room like this this morning trying to convince you that what God's Word says, it's true. Jesus has come. He is God, very God. And He's shining His light on you this morning. You need to respond to it. But you know what the world does with the light? According to Paul's Gospel in chapter 1 of Romans, he gives us the theme of his book over there. He says... Romans chapter 1, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. By the way, are you ashamed of the gospel of Christ? It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to Jewish people first and also to the Greeks. Because therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it stands written once and forever, the just shall live by faith. Now, that's his theme to the gospel of the book of Romans. But do you know what it says right after that? If you want to have the good news, Paul says, let me give you the bad news. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And notice the next couple of words here. They suppress, they literally hold down the truth. Does that remind you of any society you know nowadays? Our society, our country was built on the principles of God's word, but today... God's word is despised and rejected of most Americans who are in leadership positions. Not all, thank God, there are some good ones. And Paul says that there will be people who are going to come along who will hold down the truth. And I'm going to say it again, you can't hold down truth forever. It's going to rise to the surface. And you know, it goes on to say, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. God's made himself very, very clear to this world. If you want to see him, you follow the light, he'll bring you into his presence. But notice, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. But if I were to take you over to Romans chapter 1, men not only hold the truth down, Paul goes on to say that they change the truth into a lie. And he says, because of that, on three different occasions in Romans chapter 1, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. He's in this room this morning. He's in you. He's with you in your trouble. He's wanting you to see greater and greater and greater light. So you'll receive his gift of salvation. What are you doing with it? This is an actual footage of a uh, fighter pilot who's about to land on an aircraft carrier. And the conditions are clear. And it reminded me of a story when I read, saw this this week of five pilots during World War I who were sent out on a mission at nighttime to look for the submarines, the enemy submarines that were approaching their aircraft, approaching the aircraft carrier. At nighttime, the captain of the ship was told that the enemy submarines now were within striking distance and that there came down a command from headquarters that all the lights would be turned off on the deck. This is a nighttime landing of an air, on an aircraft carrier. And so the command came down, the orders were followed, and they turned off all the lights. Now these pilots that had been sent out to try to find the enemy submarines started radio back, radioing back to the tower and they said, you know, 
can you turn the lights back on? We need to land our aircraft. And captain gave the orders back and he said, no, there's been an order from above. All lights be turned off for the safety of all the men on, on board this aircraft carrier. Another pilot came back and pleaded with him, can you turn on one light, two lights, three lights? I said, no, we can't turn on any lights. And one by one by one, all five of those pilots had to ditch their planes in the water. And John is saying to us in these verses here that there's, there is a God. He's God because he existed before ever there was time. He's God because he created all things that you can see and beyond. And this God is sending out his light to you. He came in the person of his son, Jesus. What are you doing with it? If you just turn your heart away from the Lord, your heart will get so hard, so hard, so hard. In the book of Romans, it says God gave them up to a reprobate mind, to their own destruction. What are you doing with his light this morning? Are you responding to it? So recognize that he's God. Receive his light. But he ends this paragraph by saying you need to receive his life. Notice what happens in verse 10. He was in the world, the cosmos, and the world was made by him. And the world, the cosmos, the world of human beings knew him not. The God who created it came and was placed in a manger, according to Luke's gospel, as a feeding trough. And he grew up. Instead of the world recognizing who this is, God, very God, what did they do? They resisted him. And eventually they rejected him and they put him on a cross. So he was in the world. That world which was made by him and the world didn't know him. And John goes on to say in verse 11, he came to his own countrymen, the Jewish people. And what did the Jewish people say? Well, when they stood before Pilate, they shook their fists and they said, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and our children. And that's exactly what's happened since that day and time. They rejected the only Savior. He came to his own, his own received him not. But here's the good news. To as, as many as will reach out by faith and receive this precious, darling gift of life. God says, I'll do something for you. I'll give you, you the authority to become my child. Even to those who believe on his name. Those are the requirements. They do not change. John set them in concrete back then and they're in force today. If you receive him by faith, he'll give you the gift of eternal life. Now here's in verse 12 some of the ways that we try to come to God on our own. Which were born, John says, not of blood. You know what it means to be born of blood? Some people actually think because they're in church. And in some cases, generation after generation after generation, God... Praise God for people who are in church generation, generation after generation after generation. But you know, just because of your last name doesn't mean you're going to God's heaven. Which were born not of blood, not because your mom and dad were saved. Sometimes when you talk to people, they'll, one of the things they'll do is say, Oh yeah, my cousin or my nephew's a pastor. Like, well, where did that come from? Who's asking anything about your nephew or cousin? You've got to repent of your sin. You've got to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. So it's not of blood, John says. It's not of the will of the flesh. You know what the flesh is? Your old way of doing things. Sometimes if we're not careful, we think we can go to heaven because we're a church member. Or because we're in church. Or because we've been baptized. We're looking in the book of Philippians now. Chapter 3, Paul was circumcised. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. From the tribe of Benjamin. I, I've had it all. But... Paul says, all those things I had to count but loss so that I could receive the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Our Lord. It's not because of blood. It's not because of the will of the flesh. It's not even the will of man, your religion. But John tells us it's of God. So do you recognize the one in the manger? The heart of Christmas is Jesus. He's God. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father loved you so much he sent his Son. And Jesus, when he raised from the dead and went back to heaven, sent his Holy Spirit, who's here today operating. 
And when the rapture takes place, you'll be on your own. John wants to know, what are you going to do with it? John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way. They wouldn't walk in him. I am the truth. They wouldn't believe in him. And he said, I am the life. And they crucified him. What will you do with Jesus this morning? You're not promised tomorrow. I read this startling headline this week. On Tuesday of this past week, here is one of the parliamentary members of the nation of Turkey. And he's just waxing. I actually watched the video of it. He's waxing and waning against the nation of Israel. And you see that sign on the podium there? You know what that says in the Turkish language? Murderous Israel. And he kept waxing and waning, ranting and raving. And after a while, the last thing he said was, the Jewish state will suffer the wrath of Allah. And he fell over with a heart attack. They took him to the hospital. He lived two days and he died this past Thursday. And it reminded me of what John's after here this morning. I know we like all the, the setting of the book of Luke and we like to see the shepherds and we like to see the wise men from Matthew's gospel and that's a wonderful thing to behold, but what are you doing with the baby in the manger? He's not a plastic imitation. He's God, very God, because he existed forever and will always exist forever. He created all things. He's shining his light upon your heart this morning. And he's wanting you to reach out by faith and receive his special gift. And that's why John says in verse 14, this is John's aerial view of Christmas. The word was made flesh. Literally, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we got to see it, John says. We got to see and behold his glory. Remember the Shekinah glory that came in the tabernacle? It didn't stay there forever, by the way. The same glory came to Solomon's temple that we've been studying this year. And what is it? First Kings chapter 8? It didn't last there forever either. But we saw his glory. It was the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, filled with grace and truth. Do you recognize Jesus is here this morning? And secondly, if you recognize who he is, are you responding to his light? And finally, if you're responding to his light, why don't you reach out by faith and receive the gift that allows you to come and sit at the banqueting table in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Let me just say it again. When John finished with his seven miracles, he put at the end of his book, chapter 20, verse 30, many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, his followers. that are not written in this book. But John says, I've written these so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing that, you can have life in his name. Life as life was meant to be lived. Won't you enjoy that life today? Let's bow our heads. If you're here this morning without Jesus Christ, that's why we have the Gospel of John. So that you won't miss this moment, this chance, this opportunity to come to the banqueting table and sit down and enjoy fellowship with the Godhead. His Holy Spirit will come and take up residence within you. Christ, who's at the right hand of the Father, will be making intercession for you on your behalf. And one day when this is, earth is over, and this journey has ended for the child of God. We're going to get to stand before God face to face. And deep down, that's what you really want this Christmas. And if you don't have that relationship, I'm asking you to come to Jesus today. Repent of your sin. Give your heart and life to him. Won't you do that? By the way, believer, are you sharing this message of the real meaning of Christmas this holiday season? Don't miss the opportunities God is giving you. And if you need to come to this altar and make some things right with the Lord, that's why we're having this invitation right now. Let God speak to your heart and respond to what he asks you to do. Father, thank you so much for the book of John. Thank you for this unique approach to Christmas. Sometimes we just get uh, all caught up in the trappings and we miss the individual in the manger. And we thank you, Father, for this uh, John's view 
of who Jesus truly is. May we truly make our way to him this Christmas season and humbly bow before him and recognize his lordship and authority over our lives. And may you continue to bring our lives into conformity with his life. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing an old Christmas carol entitled, O Come All Ye Faithful. forget this evening at six o'clock there is the, the little toddlers I think are going to start the program and it works all the way up to the adult choir you won't want to miss it it's always a, a fun time and then we're having a fellowship after that this evening and if you could help us set up tables and chairs back in the back after the service that would be helpful too so I think that's all the announcements for now let's pray and uh, we'll get to go home for some rest okay father thank you for John's gospel and we thank you for giving us a detailed view of this little baby that was in the manger. The one who existed from all eternity past. The one who spoke the worlds into existence is the one in the manger. He's the one who came so that he could live a sinless life and die on that cross on our behalf. And we can never thank you enough for that. But then he rose again to give us eternal life and to invest us with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Father, we just praise you and thank you for what you've done for us. Now help us to go out and give this message to the world, this lost and dying world, so that Jesus will be praised and glorified this Christmas season. We pray and ask it in his name. Amen. Have a good afternoon.